The time drew near for our departure, and we had a wonderful send-off by the Christians in Jefferson Street Gospel Hall and in Avenue 54 Gospel Hall 2. We left Los Angeles on November 19 and 26 by the Grace Line traveling to Guatemala down the Pacific Coast calling in at a few ports in Mexico. A few days before sailing, I got a message to go to the office of the Grace Company line. A gentleman wanted to see me. This gentleman was in the lumber business in Mexico. He generally traveled by train, but there was a railroad strike on in Mexico, so he not, could not get that way. There was no other way to go, only by boat. So there seemed to be a difficulty, as the boat was already full. He and the agent wanted to know if my wife and I would give up our room to him and his wife as far as Mazatlan in Mexico. While I shared a room with three other men, and Nettie shared a room with some other ladies. Upon arriving in Mazatlan, a first-class cabin would be vacant, which we would have to ourselves all the way down to Guatemala. This seemed to us to be very uh, wonderful. So we at once made arrangements to do so. We had a wonderful send off, as I have said, and soon the boat pulled out from Wilmington from whence we sailed. We had a nice time going down the Pacific. It was wonderfully calm. However, a storm came up and we had lightning and thunder. Lightning and thunder that we had never experienced before. This, of course, made many of the passengers uneasy. However, soon we got to Mazatlan and as was arranged, we transferred to the first-class quarters. We were very, very comfortable there and thanked the Lord for his kindness in making this provision for us. As we went along, many lessons were to be learned which we found very helpful. For instance, going down to Mexico, there was a young man this young man could speak a little Spanish. And as we neared the port, we, the, we were met by some of the authorities. They had a little boat, and in the little boat were some sailors. These sailors were on their bare feet, and they weren't in uniform. And this young man made some remarks about them and their condition and partly made fun of them. He was supposed to be going to Mexico, but no doubt some could understand what he was saying. And the result was he was not allowed to get into Mexico. He had to uh, get on the boat again. And later on, he was transferred to another grace line coming up next, uh, Guadam uh, next uh, California. So we at once caught on and learned to keep our thoughts to ourselves. This was a wonderful 
lesson for us. We enjoyed the trip for the realm, and soon we came to Champarico. Now, Champarico was the port for Guatemala, where we were getting off. There was no real ducks there. The boat had to anchor outside, and we were transferred by a crane and a little cage from the boat down into one of the very small boats to take us to the shore. This was quite an experience, but I must say I enjoyed it very much. Other passengers, of course, did not. Soon we landed and were met by one who was to come to take us from there to Gazaltenango. However, we had to pass through customs. The men at the customs did not appear to be very friendly. Indeed, he did not help us very much. So much so, it was necessary for us to stay overnight, which we uh, did not want to do. However, there was no other way out. And the next day, we were told our luggage would be taken to Retalalau, and there we had passed through customs. However, we were allowed to take our hand baggage, and uh, arrangements was made to take us by car from Champarico to Gazaltenango. Or at least I might say the train took us from Champarico. There were no roads at that time from Champarico. So we left and got to Mazatlan. I mean to say to Mazatenango. However, when we got there, there were no cars to take us up. And the gentleman who had met us tried to make all arrangements possible. However, it seemed impossible. At last he came about 10 o'clock at night. We were still waiting and waiting to see what we could do. And he told us he made arrangements for a special trip to be made so that we could go on to Gazaltenango. However, the man, they had the car, didn't seem to care for the arrangements. So when we got out of the uh, city a little ways, he, the car stopped and he got out. And as far as we could make out, he himself let the air out of one of the tires so that we had a flat. He told us he could go no further, that he had a flat, and he had no way of repairing the, uh, the uh, tire. Uh, another car came along, and they had nothing either. So he said he would have to go back. So he got back in another car that was coming the other way and left us sitting there. Of course, we did not know what was happening. We did not understand enough of the language to know. And I suspected it might have been some kind of a holdup. So I transferred the little money that we had, which amounted to $400. I got that out of my pocket and I put it down my sock leg and thought it would be secure there. So at last another man came along with another car and uh, arrangements were made and he very kindly took us from there up to Gazaltenango. I think it was somewhere after two between 2 and 3.30 in the morning when we arrived there. We, of course, we were hungry and soon had something to eat. And then we were uh, con uh, taken to our bedroom. 
Now our bedroom was rather narrow and it wasn't very long. It had no window in it. It had just one door which opened to the patio in the back of the house. There was no windows to the sides, only one window in the living room that opened out to the front road. These kind of houses were in vogue then, and uh, I did not, nor Natty did not care very much for them. However, as we were now missionaries, we made up our minds we had to take things as they came, and I might say that is the best way to do it. You know, everything has an end. Everything has its day. So that part of our experience had its day too. And at other times in our lives, we were more comfortably situated. But at the present, we were all right. So then, our life was given over to the study of the language, in which we are very happy to say we found a young lady there who was very capable, and she helped us in a wonderful way with the language. However, <clears throat> this dear gentleman with whom we were staying, uh, although he was uh, not very nice in many ways, yet he was possible, at least as far as we were concerned, so we could make our own life to a certain extent. However, he turned out to be rather well, it's difficult just to say, not very pleasant indeed. But however, we were thankful for the moment, knowing that all things come to an end one day. And uh, as uh, time went on, we found that everything was all right as long as he gave the order for it. But if he didn't give the order for it, it was unscriptural. But the very thing that was unscriptural later on, well, wasn't unscriptural. So we came to the conclusion it was scriptural if he agreed with it. But if he didn't agree with it, it wasn't scriptural. Now that to me was rather strange, but that was the way of it which turned out to be more and more as the years passed by. However, his wife was not very, very well and seemed to be in great necessity. So we very kindly helped all we could. Even Nettie sold her wedding presents that she had got before we left at our wedding day. And these were sold so it could be helped out. And very soon all the money was gone. But the Lord very kindly came in and sent all that was necessary. Soon this dear woman had to go to the States. And afterwards her husband followed her. Then we were left all alone. Then we had more liberty. Then life became a little more pleasant. So we went on learning the language. And in nine months, I was able to give messages in Spanish. However, these messages were written out in English. They were translated into Spanish, and then I practically read them out. The great difficulty was when I had finished reading, the message was finished, the meeting was over. However, that had one advantage. I learned something through that. I, of course, had been taught and the work in which I was engaged 
to be punctual. So when a meeting was advertised to start at seven o'clock, I started at seven o'clock. But sometimes the congregation didn't come at seven o'clock. In fact, in those days, with very few people, it was rather difficult to know if anyone would come or not. So I got into the habit of starting the meeting punctual on the minute when seven o'clock appeared. However, one night I did the same thing and there were very few in the meeting. I finished after I had all I read out that I could say and closed the meeting. Then quite a number came along. They were surprised to know that the meeting was finished. Well, I said, don't we start at seven? I started at seven. And I said, I finished the meeting. I couldn't go on anymore. My message was finished. So in the future, those dear people were sure to be on time at seven o'clock. Now, I have noticed many things concerning this that taught me that uh, human uh, beings are rather, rather strange in this way. I once suggested that if seven o'clock was too soon, we would have the meeting at 7.30. All right, the meeting was announced at 7.30, but yet they didn't come until five or ten minutes after. And then I said we'd better have the meeting at eight o'clock, but at eight o'clock it was all the same. They didn't come at eight o'clock. They came at uh, 10 or 15 minutes past 8 o'clock. So you see, it th that wasn't the trouble. The trouble with them is they didn't think. They weren't interested enough to know that the meeting started at a certain hour and they were supposed to be at that hour. So I learned it didn't matter what hour, 7, 8, 9, or 10. There are always some who will come in 10 or 15 minutes afterwards. So therefore I began to think it isn't the time. They have got plenty of time, but they just don't use the time profitably. Pretty soon I was able to give my messages only by using headlines. This indeed made the messages more interesting. And as time went on, I did not even need headlines. However, because of circumstances uh, outside of my control, I was not able to learn the language perfectly. I had been you know, nearly all my life troubled with migraine headaches and I had to be very careful not to read too much nor to study too much. In fact that was a great drawback to the learning of the language. At times I got frustrated so much that I even threw the book away. I was so downhearted but however I was enabled to go right on and do what I could. So in one way, I never did learn the language. I just grew into it. And of course, as long as I could make myself understood, that was all that was necessary. Thank the Lord for those who were able to go ahead and study hour after hour and hour after hour and never have a pain in their head. Thank the Lord for those kind of people. My wife was like that. 
and she was able to continue with the studies hour after hour and keep reading and she did not know what a headache was. Well, thank the Lord for that. That was wonderful because I never would like anyone to have to suffer the way I and others have done with migraine headaches. The fact of the matter is we cannot explain to others and others cannot have an idea of what it means to have a gnawing headache minute after minute, hour after hour, and day after day at times. It knocks you out. It takes away your mode of thinking. You can't even collect your thoughts at times. And in times, in fact, it leaves you useless. And that's what indeed is annoying, to think that you're no good, to think that you're holding others back. And that is indeed some a pain in itself. But however, those who have migraine headaches I'll have to put up with it. However, I think the Lord makes it up to them in some other way, which it appeared it was so in my case, but that we will not speak about at present. Thank the Lord for Nettie. She was able to pick up the Spanish perfectly. In fact, she became quite a teacher of Spanish. And at times she has been a wonderful help to me in many ways in that line. I do not know how I would have got along without her in this respect. She was the one who helped me so much. If there was a difficulty in the language, she would go ahead and overcome that difficulty. Then she could explain it to me as others did not seem to have the capacity to do so. Of course, she knew my weakness. She knew the whys and the wherefores of everything. And in that way, she was able to have patience and compassion and would explain and re-explain in such a way that soon I would be able, at least in some little measure, to express myself and get the message over. Later on, I was able to go out and have gospel meetings in various places. In one of these places, while I was distributing gospel texts and inviting the people to come to the meetings, I was attracted by a dog in front of me, and he stood there barking with his teeth bared. And of course, I thought I had better be very careful of that dog. But there was one came behind, and before I knew it, he had me by the leg. Well, that was very painful indeed. And I went back to the place where I was staying. There was nothing in that village. No doctors, no drug stores, no one with any experience. And all that I could find was salt, salt and dirty rags. So those were applied to my leg but however, as it was not improving, I thought I had better get back home to Gazaltenango. Now, in those days, 
traveling was by truck. Trucks would carry goods to the various towns, and should there be a place, the truck driver would, for a certain amount of money, give you a ride. Well, I was told where I could get a the mail car, and if I would walk there, the mail car would take me on to Gazaltenango. However, upon arriving in that place and waiting for some considerable time, the mail car came along, but was unable to take me as it was already well filled. Now, well filled means down there that people are packed in in such a way that it would be rather difficult to get another person in. So I was informed that I could not have a place in that car. When can I get one? Perhaps tomorrow, they said. Well, there was nothing for it to start out and walk. Now, that was a 20-mile walk with a bad leg. And I might say, indeed, it took me some considerable time. And with much difficulty and pain, I eventually arrived home. And there, of course, my wife was ready for the occasion, and she started in, and in a few weeks, my leg was all right again. At another time, while I was distributing tracts in another place, five dogs surrounded me, and they were coming in little by little, and they were making all kinds of noises with their teeth bared. The owner of those dogs stood and laughed. However, at last, when he saw that there was a great necessity, he came in and controlled the dogs. Now, at another time, I distributed tracts in this little village. And after finishing, I walked on to see if there was some other village before. But as I walked and walked and kept walking for some considerable time, I expect about an hour, I had made a circle, and I came back right again to that same village. So there you are. Many, many things comes in in one's life that as teaches one a lesson if the would only apply it to future use. I was invited to a wedding down on the coast. Now down on the coast it's very hot. So hot I found it impossible to use a coat. I made my shirt and pants do. I never did use any underwear. It was much too hot for me and affected my head too much. On this occasion, when I went to the wedding, I was not allowed to go in because I did not have a coat on. Now, Nettie came to the help of that time. She had a sweater, so she gave me her sweater, and I put on the sweater, so therefore I was all right. I could go in and attend the uh, wedding ceremony. Now, the wedding ceremony was conducted by the mayor of the town. Now, the mayor of the town, I noticed, was sitting and he on his bare feet. He had neither socks nor shoes on. 
and I noticed he had four pens sticking out of his pocket. However, when it came time to uh, uh, go through with the ceremony, it was his secretary who did that. And after speaking for some time, then he gave the paper for the mayor to sign. But this dear man, I noticed, put an axe down. That meant to say that he could not write. So the secretary had to do the writing too. So it was rather funny indeed to see me sitting there with my wife's sweater on her arm. However, it fitted the occasion and saved the situation. At another time, I was stopped going through one of the villages uh, by the uh, traffic man. And uh, he uh, informed me it was unlawful to drive a car without a coat on. Now they had some ridiculous laws at that time in that place. However, as time went on, they began to learn more and understand more. And they found out that it was a ridiculous thing to wear a coat in such weather. Even I noticed when the um, Philip um, of England came down, he too did away with the coat. What do you think about that now? So uh, that cleared up many other questions in my mind. Lots of these things are man-made things. There's nothing stricter about them, but it just suits man and his P-R-I-D-E at times. Well, now, I had some other experiences there. We went to a place where prisoners were kept, and these prisoners were made to work. It was a very, very hot place, infested with many mosquitoes and it was rather difficult to get out of their way. In fact, the matter is, one had to sleep with a mosquito net over them. And uh, poor Nettie suffered on that trip. Uh, she had to get under the mosquito net with a very fat, big woman. And I tell you, the smell inside there wasn't very pleasant, but it was all in a day's work. And soon we finished up in that place and uh, made all haste in our power to get away from it. So you see, there are many things comes into one's life, but as I said before, everything comes to an end. It doesn't keep on and keep on all the time. In about uh, one year's time, the gentleman of the house came back home again. So we thought it would be a good idea to move on to a new place. We went down to San Felipe. Now San Felipe was 30 miles down on the coast. It was rather warm there, but there were good opportunities to visit the many villages around and take the gospel to those people. We learned many lessons, of course, as we uh, were occupied in the work. One of them was have patience and to take the second place. For instance, we needed a stove. Now, it was wood stoves that were in use. 
wood was plentiful and uh, coal, well, they did not know what coal was, and as for gas, there was no such thing. So wood was the principal fuel for the fire and for heating purposes. However, for heating purposes, you did not need anything as it was generally hot enough. Well now, this gentleman, he volunteered to take us to let to the bow to where there were some stores, general stores. So we went in and had a look around and decided on a certain stool. So we bought that stool and we paid the amount that was asked for it and it was to be delivered in a few days. However, day after day went by and no stool appeared. One week went by and no stool appeared. We waited a few days more and then went back to the store to see what had happened, why they had not sent it. Well, the owner of the store said, yes, he sent it. Well, we never received it. After a little more conversation, we found out that this gentleman had told him to send it to his house, as he wanted one too. But as there was only one, well, we bought that one, but he had it sent to his house, but he did not pay it. So I said, that strange thing. We bought the stove, we paid for the stove, you were to deliver the stove, and they said, instead of delivering it to us, you delivered it to a man who did not pay for it. And I had quite a conversation with them about that. Well, the upshot of it all was, he said, look here, I know I did wrong. I tell you what to do. Go to a certain store and take a letter with them which I would give you, and you can pick out any stove that you wish. So my wife and I, went to this other stove with the letter and presented and the owner of that store showed us several uh, stoves which he had and we decided on a certain one we knew the price would be the same at least that's what we are told it was and whatever stove we wanted we could take this was a much better stove than the one that we had bought at the first. It was uh, uh, ornamented and it was uh, better in every way. So we got that stove and took it home and installed it and liked it very much. And then the other gentleman came down with his wife and they saw the stove. And they said, where did you get that stove? Well, we told them what had happened, and there you are. We had a much better stove than the one that we would have had had that gentleman not given the order to send it to his house and send it to ours. So there you are. We learned that sometimes it's much better in fact, it's more profitable to take the second place and how things just as they seem to come. Well, now, that was that over. Now, we had some other interesting uh, times in that place, and uh, we had some enjoyable times, of course, at the same time, taking the gospel to the various villages. However, there was a gentleman came from Honduras, a missionary who was living there and had been there for a short time. 
In fact, he had been a culprit for the American Bible Society for many years, and his headquarters was in Panama City. Now, he rode out from Panama City on a mule, and he visited all the uh, republics around. He came up into Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and in fact he was in Colombia and uh, Venezuela at the same time. He covered all that district, selling Bibles to all those who cared to buy. He was a very interesting man and had some very interesting stories to tell. Of course, on his trips, as everyone else does, who spends some time down there, he went down with malaria, and at times he was left for dead. But however, the Lord had compassion upon him and raised him up again. At that time, there was not so many medicines for that uh, trouble as there are today. And of course, doctors were very few, and medicines were hard to be found. But at the same time, the local people had their own medicines, and sometimes those medicines were very good. So he had his own way of treating malaria when it came along, which it did many times in his life. He had very interesting times and the various republics in which he entered. At one time, he was taken for a uh, uh, general, a revolutionary general, a rebel, you might say. And the soldiers lifted him and took him to their uh, headquarters and imprisoned him there until that they would see uh, their head general. So long and at last the head general came, and uh, as soon as he saw this dear man by the name of Alfredo Hawkins, well, he asked, what are you doing here? The fact of the matter is they knew each other. They were well acquainted with each other, and the general had known Don Alfredo, as he was called, for a long time. And Don Alfredo had known him for quite a time, too. So the general was surprised to see him there. And he asked him, what are you doing here? Don Alfredo says, I don't know. These men of yours brought me in, and they said that I was General Tosta. Now, General Tosta was one of the rebel generals, and of course they thought that they had caught General Tosta. Don Alfredo had a complexion much the same as this general's, and although this man was an English man and spoke Spanish rather brokenly at that time, yet for some reason they shot, thought sure they had this general. So they took him in, and uh, there he was until the proper general of that battalion came along. And uh, they had quite a time together, the two of them, laughing over what had happened. And then the general asked them where he wanted to go. So Don Alfredo says, I want to go back home to San Pedro Zula. That's where he lived. So, and then the general, he said, well, we'll try and get you there. So he called some soldiers in, told them to prepare for the trip to go to San Pedro Zula to see that Don Alfredo got to his home in safety, which he did in the length of time. 